Now, I don't usually uh, title my homilies, but if I had to title this one, I, the only thought that came to my mind was, Why I Hate My Seminarians. They're not here today, so I can say all I want, but I'm living with them this summer, and I hate them because they make me feel so bad about myself. They come back with this new zeal and the beginning of the priesthood and all their, their zeal for souls and for prayer and getting up in the morning and praying and fasting. And I feel like one of those 300-pound you know, uh, track coaches that's already seen his prime and is just telling them to one more time around the track and I can't even tie my own shoes in the morning. You know, so it's, it's a reminder sometimes of where you began and where you are. And just this last weekend, it was a, a great gift because I celebrated my sixth year of completing my sixth year of priesthood and 16 years after following the vocation. And just like in marriage, you know, you get these different benchmarks, these anniversaries, and it's, it's a celebration, but it's also a time to look at, you know, where are you now based on where you began and how has life changed you? change your relationship, change your ideals. You know, we, we need at times an external standard to measure ourselves against in order to understand where we are in the present moment. You know, I could also say this is why I hate my parishioners because I have the same feeling coming down with you guys. I've actually been so inspired by so many of you for your devotion, number one, to our church, but your love for our country and your willingness to sacrifice and defend your families and our faith in so many different ways, especially the fathers of the household, you know, who give themselves so tirelessly to, to protect and provide for their family, and their mothers who are nur nurturing the faith for their children. And I, I was thinking about, it reminded me of Fulton Sheen, one comment he said, he said, you know, why is it that so few realize the seriousness of our present crisis in our times? Partly because men do not want to believe that their own times are wicked. Partly because it involves too much self-accusation. And principally because they have no standards outside themselves by which to measure their times. Only those who live by faith really know what is happening in the world. The great masses without faith are unconscious of the destructive process going on around them. If that was true in the 1970s when he said that, how much true, more true is it for us here today? And you see a lot of people who are just living in the world, especially those who were bored, you know, after the 2000s, just kind of floating with how things are going, the direction that our country is going in. And yet those who have faith, those who really awaken to Christ, you begin to see your life in contrast to a very different world out there and the decision of what it means to follow Christ and what it means to reject the world becomes far more clear. You know, we, on this Saturday, we celebrated the, right after the Sacred Heart of Jesus, the Solemnity of the Sacred Heart. That was the day I was ordained, had my first Mass. The day after that, Saturday is always the celebration of the Immaculate Heart of the Blessed Virgin Mary. And what's fascinating is that the devotion to the Immaculate Heart of Mary has grown exponentially in the past hundred years, where more popes are talking about it, bishops are doing it, priests are consecrating their parishes to the Immaculate Heart, and Mary herself, in so many different apparitions, is inviting people to become devoted to her Immaculate Heart. And, and it's even in Fatima. You know, when Mary predict, predicted that the Second World War was going to take place, right, that, that there would be a large kind of breaking away of customs in the West and traditions would fall away and that the heirs of Russia would spread throughout the world. What was her antidote? What did, what did she say would, would conquer at the end? Her Immaculate Heart. So I've been thinking about that. What does it mean, you know, in light of this last weekend, what does it mean that Mary's Immaculate Heart in the end will triumph. And what can that do for us in our own spiritual life, in our journey with Christ, in the midst of a society that seems to be crumbling many different directions? And to understand this, we must understand the link between truth and sin. Only those who live in the truth can understand the corruption 
that sin brings about in society and in our own lives. Pope Paul VI in the 1960s, 1964, he said, the greatest sin of our times perhaps is the loss of the sense of sin. We no longer feel the gravity of sin in the world. Why? Because it's become commonplace. It's become trivial. We see abortion, contraceptive, divorce, adultery. We see people falling away from, from Christ and the faith everywhere. And it's becoming the new norm. And when we fall away from the truth, we also lose the sense of sin. Our intellect becomes darkened so that we no longer know the difference between right and wrong, between good and evil. And when that happens, that's when you get a, what's called a dictatorship of relativism. Right? That when everyone starts to just act according to what feels good for them, and the only thing that becomes the great sin of the time is judgment. Anytime one person says what is right and what is wrong, to judge another person's sin. To even judge something as wrong in our times, you become a bigot or a dogmatist. At the same time, which is so ironic, to accept sin and to even encourage vice, you're called merciful and kind and even Christ-like as if the greatest enemy in the life of Christ was not sin and the devil. Without a sense of truth, there can be no right or wrong, and the only evil is judgment. But I think that is why, you know, this month, obviously, we're seeing a lot with the, the pride flags everywhere, and, you know, the, the whole movement of, of the pride LGBTQ, and it's ironic, like our first reading today talked about the fall, right, of Adam and Eve. And how ironic that they would, would choose that word pride to reflect their decision, right? Pride, the original sin of eating from the fruit, the forbidden fruit, and doing it with the understanding that we can become our own gods, choosing for ourselves what is right and what is wrong. Because in the end, that's what it means to become one's God. You get to decide what you do with your life. You're not beholden to anyone. And the only sin in that kind of paradigm is to judge. And with that, cultures fracture. And that's why they keep stealing more and more letters from the alphabet. I mean, it's not united. I mean, it's, it's a mob. Like, they're all their own individual classes all fighting for their own individual rights, but they're just coming together to make a lot of noise. But there is no unity with the devil. There is no unity with sin. The only one that brings about unity is Christ and the truth. That's why I always tell you that the most important thing for us as Catholics is to be united in our faith, to protect ourselves from any ideologue that goes and says just this little piece of the faith or anything outside of the faith. In a time when everyone is fra fracturing, our greatest strength as Catholics is to be united underneath our bishops and our Pope in our Catholic faith. That's our strength and unity. But how does this relate to the Immaculate Heart of Mary. What is it that Mary would offer our times when she would say all this great fracturing would come about, and yet in the end, my Immaculate Heart would triumph? Well, the Immaculate Heart, Mary was conceived without sin. And she never sinned in her entire life. And one thing that that means is that she was more sensitive to sin than anybody else who ever lived besides Christ himself. She felt the pain of sin of others. It's just like if whenever you, you know, clean your room or clean your car or buy new shoes, you're very sensitive to anything that gets out of order after that, right? But if it's been a while, you know, it doesn't matter if there's just another thing thrown on the ground. But Mary, being so pure and clean and immaculate, she had a great sense of sin. 
And the unforgivable sin that Christ speaks about in today's Gospel, right, the sin against the Holy Spirit, it's when the Pharisees blaspheme by saying that basically He has no power to save. When we reject the idea that we are in sin, Christ can do nothing for us. If someone refuses to accept that they have an illness or go to the doctor to receive the medicine, He cannot save them. And so in a time when we're living in a world that has lost the sense of sin, where we do not feel the effects of sin so much in ourselves or in society, when our intellect is darkened, we no longer have a need to go to Jesus Christ to seek His mercy and salvation. Therefore, He is powerless to save us. Mary opens our eyes to the need for conversion, our need for grace, and our need to repent. And I think that's why, exactly why Christ upholds her at the end of that gospel, right? Not blessed because she's my mother or because we have the same blood, but because she was always obedient to the will of the Father. Mary's entire being, part of her immaculate heart, means that she was always receptive to God's will in her life always seeking whatever pleased God. Let it be done to me according to your word were the, some of the first words we ever heard from her. And the last words from Mary and that we have in the Gospels were do whatever He tells you. Mary's entire being was receptivity to the will of God just as it was the being of her Son, Jesus Christ. Which is the complete opposite of the temptation of Adam and Eve to grasp and take control of their life, to decide for themselves what is right and what is wrong. All right, so in honor of our, our Blessed Mother, I want to I wanna encourage everyone to look at the apparitions of Our Lady of Good Success. Have you guys heard of that? All right, so this has been a really uplifting, beautiful, feel-good homily so far. We're going to take it to the next level with one of the most dire predictions of our times that we've ever seen. Like Mary, you guys have never heard of Our Lady of Ecuador, of Good Counsel? I'm a terrible priest, or you were terrible Catholics, one of the two. But I'm telling you about it now, so I'm out. Um, this happened in 1599 in Ecuador, Spain. Uh, Mary appeared to, what's her name? Uh, Mother Mariana de, Tor de Jesus Torres. And she gave her a message for 500 years down the road of what would take place in the 20th century and into the 21st in the ripple effect. And every bishop um, since this apparition has approved the messages that has come through her. And if that wasn't enough, her body still to this day is incorrupt. So her body never decomposed. And basically there's one time when she was praying in the chapel and she was all the lights were off and just the sanctuary lamp was on and all of a sudden the sanctuary lamp went out. And Mary appeared to her and basically said, this is what is going to happen in the 20th century. The sanctuary lamp, the lamp that reminds us of the presence of Christ in the Holy Eucharist, the lamp that guides us into the Catholic Church, the lamp of the faith was going to be extinguished in many places throughout the world. And she, she talked about three great corruptions that would take place in our times in matrimony, traditional customs, and the priesthood. Right? So matrimony, the customs, and the priesthood. And to me, this is the standard. We all need a standard, a mirror, by which we can look at ourselves and say, where do I stand up against this? Where am I in my life? And remember, there is no standard for people who are living in subjective times. It's all about that... that um, when relativism takes away the mirror. I'm no longer seeing myself from external standards. I'm just looking at my own self. So we have the faith to look at our times in light of this and hopefully experience a conversion and a deeper conscious exam of where do I need forgiveness in my own life? Where have I given myself away to these times? So first in matrimony. I'm, I'm only giving you a piece of each one but I encourage everyone, especially in light of Mary's feast day, to, to look deeper into Our Lady of Good Success. Matrimony. 
marriage will be attacked and profaned to the fullest sense of the word. This is a time when marriage was illegal. Adultery was illegal. The government will enact iniquitous laws with the objective of doing away with this sacrament, making it easy for everyone to live in sin. She talked about the customs that would arise. The Christian spirit will rapidly decay, extinguishing the precious light of faith until it reaches the point that there will be almost a total and general corruption of customs. There will be unbridled luxury. Innocence will almost no longer be found in children, nor modesty in women. There will be almost no virgin souls left in the world. And then the corruption of priests. And this I read for myself. In this supreme moment of need in the church, those who should speak will fall silent. The sacred sacrament of holy orders will be ridiculed, oppressed, and despised. The demon will try to persecute the ministers of the Lord in every possible way, and he will labor with cruel and subtle astuteness to deviate them from the spirit of their vocation, corrupting many of them. Those corrupt priests who will scandalize the Christian people will incite the hatred of the bad Christians and the enemies of the Catholic Church to fall upon all priests. And she concludes, the secular clergy will leave much to be desired because priests will become careless in their sacred duties. Lacking the divine compass, they will stray from the road traced by God for the priestly ministry, and they will become attached to wealth and riches. How the church will suffer during this dark night, lacking a father to guide them with paternal love, gentleness, strength, wisdom, and prudence. Many priests will lose their spirit, placing their souls in great danger. It's very sobering, but how accurate could you say to the experience of so many in our times. 500 years before this would even take place. Only those who live by faith really see what is going on in the world. And that's why I need seminarians. That's why I need that fresh blood coming into the church over and over reminding me what my original zeal is and what I'm supposed to be. And that's why we need one another in the church, striving for fidelity to Christ and reminding each other what we should be in the midst of a culture that stands in such stark contrast against that. And that's why most of all, we all need devotion to the Immaculate Heart of the Blessed Virgin Mary, that we may never lose the sense of sin in the world and in our lives. And through her own fiat and obedience that she lived in everything in her relationship with her Christ, may that echo in every one of our hearts that we too may become brothers and sisters and family of Jesus Christ. Our Lady of Good Success, pray for us.